Wow. God is here, and he's, he's moving in this place. I don't know what you've, uh, you've come today expecting, but if you're expecting to meet with God and to be transformed by him, that's available for you this morning. Can we just start with prayer? Wow. Father, we thank you for a new day, another opportunity to, to dig into your word. We thank you, Jesus, for the price that you paid on our behalf. Would that not be what we, what we save until the end, but would it be what we celebrate right from the beginning, Jesus, that it's you. It's all you. It's all about you. Thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit that you sent to edify us, to guide us, to teach us into right living. So Holy Spirit, have your way in our hearts this morning. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. How many of you guys, just a quick show of hands, have found any of the, the sermons that we've been digging into over the course of Romans to be a little bit challenging? Anybody? Anyone? Yeah, I love it. So good. Okay, good. So I'm not alone. I'm glad. I'm glad. As Christians, we find ourselves in a bit of a tricky spot because we want to honor God. We want to live how he calls us to live. We want to be guided by his word as kind of the the guidelines for good Christian living. But at the same time, I mean, it's almost a cliche to say, but at the same time, we're so easily distracted. I mean, the first things that go, what are they? We all know them. The first things that go are our prayer, our worship, and our Bible study. As soon as anything pops up, and it almost makes me laugh how often we fall back into the same trap. See, because we have a desire deep in our hearts, the Holy Spirit is drawing us and and urging us with with a deep unction to serve God, to live and set up our lives according to his word. But but sometimes the reality is we don't really know what his word says. There was a there was a study done in 2022, and it was in the US, um, so it might be a little bit different here, but basically they polled about 26 million people. So this is a massive study. 26 million people who call themselves Christians, they found about one in 10 actually reads their Bible daily. The stat is even a little bit crazier. Uh, When when you look at who has read the Bible front to back, it's only about one in five. About 20% of Christians have actually read the Bible. That's a little crazy. I mean, if we apply those stats to any other realm, like think about education, right? Only, Only one in 10 kids goes to school every day. And only 20% actually make it all the way through. That, that would scare us. That would be a little cause for concern. I mean, we think we hold to Christianity, but, but in reality, unfortunately, we often hold to something more akin to, to a popular religion. It's kind of a mishmash of, we take the things that we do know from Christianity, that Jesus saves, forgive your enemy, turn the other cheek. These are all great, but we also kind of have these gaps in our knowledge. We have these questions that are left unanswered, and we're kind of uncomfortable when things are left unanswered. And so we, we go to other sources. Maybe the Bible isn't completely decisive on that question, or maybe, more likely, we just haven't really looked And so we lean on our our cultural assumptions, whatever they may be, left or right. We lean on on society for the answer. If we aren't careful, we can really easily read our opinions into the Bible rather than have the word of God form our opinions. We can be led to askew really quickly. I mean, if your theology is crafted by just kind of plucking verses out of context uh, to back up whatever you already believe, you can basically make the Bible say anything. But that's what I love about Romans. That's what I love about Paul. Paul never just plucks a verse out of its narrative context. He never uh, caves to any cultural pressures on the left or on the right. He simply says the truth as is revealed to him by the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ. And it breaks down these kind of overly complex theologies that we we attempt to develop in order to answer every question. It reduces them back into these little building blocks, these little nuggets of truth that we're called to cling to with everything we have. I think that's a good thing. Sometimes we spend uh, so much time in these kind of ivory tower theologies answering every single possible question. We forget God actually called us to have the faith of children. It's not in like an ignorant or in a naive way. No, but it's a faith that is pure, 
A faith that doesn't secretly rely on us thinking we have the answer. It's faith, genuine, pure faith. People 2,000 years ago, they had just as much difficulty with this book as we, uh, we seem to have today. I mean, Paul, he was executed by the Romans because he simply would not stop telling the truth. His words and his actions, they aligned perfectly, thus confirming his faith. Sometimes, for folks in the church, if we're honest, we're kind of the opposite. We have a lot to say, but we don't have a lot of fruit. Why is that? I love this, uh, this saying I heard from a pastor the other day. He said, most Christians have two feet planted firmly in the air when it comes to their theology. <laughs> Man, I was convicted. I think at times we can all say that that's been true, where we just believe something, we adhere to something because it seems to be a commonly held belief rather than a biblical belief. And so the answer to this question, this problem that we find ourselves in, it isn't uh, just to read your Bible daily. Yes, you should do that. It isn't just to, to read the Bible front to back. Absolutely, you should do that. But the answer to this question isn't just finding more answers. That's the trap. That's what Adam and Eve did with the fruit. That's what Solomon did as he sought uh, wisdom and knowledge throughout the course of his life. And in the end, he found there was no purpose to it. That's what the Pharisees did as they studied and they memorized the law and the prophets and they still missed out on the Messiah. It doesn't depend on you having the answer. It depends on you growing in your faith. We spend far too much try time trying to explain the miracles of God than we do thanking him for them and petitioning him for more. So my petition this morning is a simple one. And I think it's one that we can all agree on. Let's find out. <laughs> if the Holy Spirit is revealing something to you this morning, if he's leading you in a direction uh, that you weren't expecting, or maybe he brings up some thoughts for you that you haven't had before and are contrary to the way you've built your theology, and that's, that's what the Holy Spirit does. The Bible says you're the Holy Spirit of truth. He guides you into all truth. Thank God he does because he's undone some really weird things I've bought into. But if that happens for you this morning, please, just don't run from it. Don't run from the change. There was once a time when, when you and I, we didn't recognize the voice of our shepherd until he first revealed himself to us. That was a game changer. That changed everything. So let's not be too hasty to run from change. I would say it's, it's really hard, if not, if not completely impossible, to be an arrogant Christian. It's kind of an oxymoron, right? To be a person who says they live by faith, but also knows the answer to everything. It doesn't quite add up. Paul demands of his audience a certain level of humility that we are all going to bring to this text this morning. The Bible is the living word of God, meaning it will change us, it will guide us, it will transform us. And so my prayer for you, and I hope your prayer for me too, is that, is that throughout today and as we continue in Romans, that we would be transformed by the word of God, not simply informed of Paul's opinions. If we've spent a year and a half studying the book of Romans and we haven't changed at all, that might be indicative of a deeper issue. We should always be changing as we're transformed into the image of our Savior, as new truth is revealed to us, truth that is as old as Jesus himself. I'm gonna pray again. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would guide us this morning. Would you just, any, any direction you wanna go this morning, would it not be limited by what we are willing to expect or any expectations that we might have of your word? Would you shake us up this morning? Would you reveal to us once more how great you are, Jesus, how kind and how loving and how caring you are? And would that word take root in our hearts? Would it not just be Holy Spirit hype on a Sunday morning, but would it, would it break deep ground and change us as we live our lives, as we lead our families, as we, as we stand and represent you in our workplaces, Jesus? So come, Holy Spirit, come and have your way. Your name we pray, amen. We're gonna finish off Romans 9 this morning. Let's start by reading that out together. Marin, I don't know if this was you, but I appreciate it. <clears throat> Romans 9, 27, that's where we're gonna start if you'd like to follow along. It says this, though the number of the Israelites be like the sand by the sea, only the remnant will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence on earth with speed and finality. 
It is just as Isaiah said previously, unless the Lord Almighty had left us descendants, we would have become like Sodom. We would have been like Gomorrah. What then shall we say that the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it? A righteousness that is by faith, but the people of Israel who pursued the law as the way to righteousness have not attained their goal. Well, why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, see, I lay in Zion a stone that causes people to stumble, a rock that makes them fall. And the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. Thank you, Father. In his anguish, Paul, Paul he's examining the current state of his nation, the state of Israel, the, the, the chosen people through whom salvation was first revealed. And he thinks about his aunts, his uncles, his cousins, brothers, sisters, peers. And it leads him to, to this distraught state. He's filled with dread. Because he knows that because of the hardness of their hearts, because they are unwilling to accept Jesus as their Messiah and accept the salvation that he offers them, instead, they'll get what their heart desires, eternal separation from God. And that leaves him filled with anguish. It's not a hard emotional state for us to imagine. How many here have brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, cousins, peers, neighbors, whatever, who are far from God and are heading down this same path? It's not far, the emotional distance between us and Paul. Last week, we were reminded of how gracious, how merciful, and how just our God is as he bears with us, as he bears with us patiently the objects of his wrath. We learned that there's actually two different words used for, for prepared, right? We learned that there's the first word, which is katartismos, for, for those who've been prepared for destruction. Katartismos means fit. It means primed. It means that, that we've chosen sin, and of course, we're going to receive the consequence of it. God's role with those prepared for destruction is completely passive. We choose sin 100% of the time. But then we learned, we learned about this other word, this word um, that's used to, to describe those prepared for mercy. It's pro etoi mason. And this word means that God actively in advance decided he decided to intervene in our situation as we were walking down the wide path that leads to destruction, and he plucked us out. He decided to engage and to save each and every one of us. God's role in salvation is 100% active, whereas his role in condemnation is passive. The Bible says, Ephesians 1, 4, that, that God actually made this decision before the foundation of the earth. He decided already to save you before even creation. But let's recognize the reality this puts us in. We're left with this kind of inherent tension. It's a tension that we hate. We try to iron it out in vain, right? The, the, the fact that somehow the totality of Scripture indicates that God is both sovereign and decides whom to show mercy to, but also, we have a responsibility to repent, to turn to him, and to put our faith in him. As John 3.15 clearly states, whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. These two concepts, they're, uh, they're irreconcilable for us, for our finite minds. For God, he holds them in perfect balance. He doesn't see an issue between the two. I mean, think, of, think for a moment. Think about all the problems, all the mysteries that we accept. Virgin birth, how? Resurrection, how? Creation, how? Holy Trinity, how? One, but also three. The union of Jesus Christ, that he's 100% man and 100% God, how? We're obsessed with the how. But it's never been about the how. It's about the who. It's about God. It's about his mercy, his justice, his kindness, his power to hold mysteries that we can't comprehend and to hold them in perfect balance. It's the same thing with the purpose of this text this morning. It's not to conclusively prove one theology over the other, but it's to grant you a glimpse of who God is. Now, wherever you stand on this, uh, this millennia-old debate, Let's just not succumb to the polarization, to the disunity of the body that comes out of it. 
The purpose of this text is to point to God, a God who is patient in the face of antagonization, a God who is filled with grace, a God who is merciful to an extent that we've never experienced, a God who cares about you to a degree that he's willing to die for you. That is what this text is about. It's about the fact that when everything seems hopeless, there's still hope. Honestly, the more time I spend with God, I feel like the less I know. (laughs) Does anybody else feel that way? I'd make a terrible apologist. (laughs) Because he undoes all these crazy ideas I bought into. He does, and he leaves me with only this. The all-powerful, all-loving creator of the universe, for some reason, apart from me, because I know I didn't earn it, still intervened, still died for me, still chose to give me a way out, all because he loves me. That's the truth. That's what I cling to. That's what I'm willing to be dogmatic with. Though the number of the Israelites be like sand by the sea, only the remnant will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence on earth with speed and finality. This simile, it paints a a beautiful picture of just the magnitude that will be lost. And so let's not rush past that. There's, there's poetic language used here, and it's to, to elicit some emotion from Isaiah's words. Each individual person represented by a grain of sand, a person who's thinking, a person who's breathing, a person who has desires, cares, and dreams, has a family who depends on them, who has issues that they're wrestling with God with, each individual person will just be washed into the oblivion of the sea. That should break our hearts. And yes, it's just. Yes, we know the penalty for sin is death, but that doesn't mean we revel in the penalty. It should break our hearts knowing what they're missing out on. So often as Christians, we become kind of calloused and, and cold towards the unsaved world. This heart posture, it could not be further from the heart posture of Jesus Christ, who while he was being crucified, while he was being put to death by his enemies, he prayed, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. This is the heart posture we're to have for the unsaved. Jesus himself prays and petitions the Father for mercy, and yet we think, well, God's gonna do what he's gonna do anyway. Why should I have to pray? (sighs) Couldn't be further from the heart posture of God. Saint Stephen, he's the first martyr in Christianity, the first one to be put to death for his faith. He understood this concept. As he was being stoned to death by his enemies, he pleased to God. He says, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Man, imagine if we prayed for our enemies that way. We don't even pray for our families that way. You, me, Paul, we aren't judges. We are imperfect people. Paul knows this, and so he's not approaching this text with a, well, should have chosen Jesus while you had the chance. No. No, his heart is breaking for each man and woman who is walking down the wide path that leads to eternal isolation. Even still, the text says, though the number of Israelites be like the sand by the sea, only the remnant will be saved. Though an innumerable amount of people will simply abandon the Lord, the Lord will not abandon you. He cannot do things that he will not do. He cannot be unfaithful because he will not be unfaithful. Faithfulness isn't something that he just does. It's a characteristic inherent to who he is. He cannot do something that he will not do. He always preserves a remnant simply because he said he would. A remnant, if you haven't uh, heard of this concept before, it's, it's the idea is it's uh, basically a faithful few who will not be washed away Uh, Not because of their works, but because of the great mercy of God. Remnant theology, it sounds kind of intense, but it's actually a very beautiful thing. One author, he puts it like this. He says, remnant theology holds that in the midst of total apostasy and the consequential terrible judgment that follows, God always has a small, faithful group that he has delivered and worked through to bring blessings by the grace of God through our faith in Jesus. We see Noah and his family. They're, they're a great example of a remnant who were saved while millions were washed into the sea. We see Joseph and his family. They were saved uh, from, from starvation, from a famine that consumed many. 
We see Elijah who led a remnant of 7,000 faithful during the time of King Ahab and Jezebel. When everybody else had turned to worshiping Baal, this foreign god, there were 7,000 who the Lord preserved. He always preserves a faithful remnant. Despite the apostasy that we see in the church, there is a faithful few through, hu- th- through whom, oh, that's tough. I don't know why I wrote it like that. Through whom the blessings of God will flow. Of the millions that have lived and died over the years, God always preserves his few. So the question that, that we all will be asking then is, okay, well, how? We love how, right? Don't forget, we love how. How, God, how do we delineate between who is in the remnant and who is just the rest? How? I have no idea. (laughs) But I do know this. I know that Jesus answers the responsibility that we have to play to grab our seat in the remnant, to accept the offer of salvation that was given to us. In Matthew 7, 13, in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus implores all who are listening, including You and I today, he says, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many enter through it. Then in John 10, 9, he confirms what we were all thinking. He says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. Whoever follows me will be saved. That's all we need. We don't need to know how. We need to know who. Now, the audience Jesus was preaching to, they, they struggled with some different issues than we face today. The, the Jews, they struggled with a, a spirit of kind of religiosity, right? The word hypocrite, it means something different in the Bible than it means to us today. Today, a hypocrite is somebody who, who says one thing but doesn't do it, right? In the Bible, a hypocrite is somebody who, who says something and who does that thing, but they do it for the wrong reasons, They do it to seek their own gain, their own glory, to impress others. This is the spirit that has grasped the people of Israel. It's what Jesus is praying against. They have this spirit of religiosity. Jesus, look what I did. I've earned it. Am I righteous now? No. (laughs) Paul, he's going to address that a little bit further down. That's what the wide gate is for the people of Israel. For you and me today, the wide gate, it looks a, a little bit different. We struggle with this idea of subjectivism. You guys have heard it? Never heard of subjectivism? It's the idea that we all can establish basically our own standard through which to see whether we measure up or not. I'm going to decide what's right for me. Forget the narrow gate. Forget the wide gate. I'm going to build my own gate, my own path to righteousness. It's my truth. It's the great problem of our era, the problem of our time. But as we often say in this church, thank God for God. Because the enemy, he might be wearing a different mask, but the answer is always the same. You already know the answer. The answer is faith in Jesus. The answer is trust in Jesus. He is the the, the way out of these subjective mazes that we get lost in. He is the one who renews our sunken souls and spirits. He is the one who who gives a lifeline for those who are dead to sin. It's always been Jesus, and it always will be Jesus. So we don't need to worry about what the enemy looks like. We don't need to be afraid when we see the enemy coming. Because our God, he never changes. His patience is vast, but his patience is not eternal. Paul, he's reminded of Sodom and Gomorrah. Unless the Lord Almighty had left us descendants, we would have become like Sodom. We would have been like Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah, some of the most famous examples of of the wide road leading to destruction. They're the most evil places in the world, maybe behind Babylon and hell. (laughs) Paul says, unless God moved, we would become like Sodom. We would have been like Gomorrah. You notice the the tense change there. We would have become like Sodom, past tense. We would have been like Gomorrah, continuous perfect tense, meaning we would have chosen sin, and then we would have gone on choosing sin time and time and time and time and time again. We would have been stuck in our evil ways, calcified in our sin nature. Thank God for God. I mean, these places, they're so saturated in sin. The Lord himself says in Genesis, the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great 
and their sin is so grievous that I will go down and see if what they've done is as bad as the outcry that's reached me. If not, I will know. I mean, and we kind of laugh when we see God talking to himself here, but of course, God already knows. God sees everything. He already knows. What I love that this reveals, though, is that God doesn't make his decision based on the outcry of others. You, me, we lie all the time. We blame other people. We try to make ourselves look better when we get caught. We say, it was that guy's fault, God. Go deal with him. God says, no. I'll go see for myself, and I'll judge accordingly. God is righteous, and and he judges according to his own standard. Lavish sin here, it, it, it catches the attention of our just God. It's obnoxious to him. It's like the glare of light off a watch. You you can't ignore it. It just keeps getting in his eyes. It's annoying. And so he deals with it. He's patient. Yes. He requires and and, and hopes and, and, and leads us towards repentance. Yes. But eventually, the wrath will come. And when it does, Paul says it will come with speed and finality. There's a not so subtle warning here. The warning is don't miss your chance. A time will come when it's simply too late. And like Pharaoh, God will say, okay, okay, you've made your choice. I remember back when I was a a youth leader, I was having a conversation with a student. He said, okay, I I, I think I've got this Christianity thing figured out. God is good. God is just. God is right. I said, yep, absolutely, all those things. And then he said, okay, and and God forgives me when I sin, right? No matter what. There's nothing I can do that will separate me from God's forgiveness. I said, yep, aside from blaspheming the Holy Spirit, you're good. You're good, you're in. And then he said, okay, in light of that, I think I'm just gonna go ahead and I'm gonna live my life kind of however I want. And then on my deathbed, I'll really quickly just dedicate my life to the Lord. We have this, this inclination as sinners to, to see how far we can get from God while still being in his good graces. How far can I get but still call myself a part of the remnant? How much sin can I allow into my life before I have to actually deal with it? I mean, this question, it reveals our heart posture. We try to abuse God for what he can offer us. We're just like Sodom, just like Gomorrah. This question, it demonstrates that you're still trying to build your own gate. You're still trying to find your own way to God, some loophole that will duck you into heaven in the last minute. I love my (laughs) mother-in-law. She's probably worried about what I'm going to say right now. I love my mother-in-law. She has all these little quips, these hilarious little quips that she uses. And sometimes we'll be watching the news or something, she'll just look at me and go, wow. Josh, the cheese is really slipping off the cracker with that one. <laughs> I love it. It's so good. But it's so true. If we think that we can dupe God, the cheese is really slipping off the cracker. <sighs> okay, hypothetically, for this youth student, he can genuinely and earnestly give his life to Jesus Christ in the last moments, and sure, in that day he will be with the Father. The thief on the cross is a very clear example of that. Hypothetically, it could happen. But man, what a lame life. Imagine being offered to live a life of blessings, a life of abundance, a life of purpose, and instead you say, nah, nah, I'll just deal with it later. I'll get to that when the time comes, whatever that means. As if we're guaranteed that there is a tomorrow. As if we're guaranteed that there is this deathbed opportunity to repent And to believe, man, when Jesus came, what did he say? He said, the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. The time is now, not tomorrow. I wonder how many in Sodom and Gomorrah were planning on putting their faith in Jesus Christ a little bit later on. I wonder how many in the church are just planning to put their faith in Jesus Christ a little bit later on. I'll get serious about it when the time comes. We are promised that tomorrow we're given today so now you have an option your option is to to stand on your own two feet to decide for yourself or or your option this morning is to run to jesus to place your faith in jesus to be preserved in the remnant by jesus thank god the offer stands right now
Sometimes we, we think we, we, we get a little confused with what faith means. We kind of equate faith to a work. Faith is not something we can boast in. Faith is not a work. A work is pointing to ourselves saying, God, look what I did. Have I earned it? Faith is pointing away, saying, God, don't look at me. I know I don't deserve it. I know I've done nothing to deserve it. I know I'm a sinner, and I know I'm selfish, and I choose myself each and every time. So when you think of me, God, don't think of me, but think of Jesus on the cross. Think of the one without blame who died in my place. That's what faith does. It points away from us. Do you believe you're enough or do you believe Jesus is enough? It's one or the other. Sodom and Gomorrah reminds us it's one or A faithful remnant will be preserved even in a doomed society, even amidst complete apostasy. And guys, we don't have to look very far to see complete apostasy in our society. We celebrate, throw parades and wave flags celebrating our sin. You don't have to look very far. Now, I'm not, I'm not trying to scare anybody. I, I don't believe in fear-mongering from the pulpit. The gospel is more than enough, but I can't lie to you either. I can't pretend like I know there's a tomorrow or another opportunity for you to put your faith in Jesus. I don't know that. And so what I do know, I will implore you with each and every day that we have, just believe. Believe in Jesus. Believe and be saved. That's the role we have to play. That's the responsibility that's on us We read in Genesis 19 that the righteous lot, which if you read the story, it's very clear that we aren't made righteous by our actions. Because Lot, he does some pretty detestable things, yet yet it says the righteous lot, who is righteous because of his faith, he and his family are allowed to escape judgment, so they flee to a place called Zoar, about five miles from Sodom. Takes roughly 40 minutes an hour, give or take. So they run to Zoar, the sun comes up, the sulfur comes down, Sodom and Gomorrah are no more. This place, this land that is infamous for its rape culture, God won't stand for it. He says, no, no more. He's patient, but his patience is not eternal. When judgment comes, it comes with speed and finality. So in light of this reality, we have a choice to make. Do I stand on my own merit and get washed into the sea like all those who have come before me? Or do I put my faith in Jesus Jesus is the great divider between the remnant and the rest. Let's continue in our passage this morning. Paul says, what shall we say then that the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it, a righteousness that is by faith, but the people of Israel who pursued the law as a way of righteousness have not attained their goal? Well, why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were by works. I think by now we all agree on this point. Salvation comes by? Oh, you guys, so good. Not by? You went for two for two. Not bad. But this next part of the text, it's pretty shocking. He quotes Isaiah once more. It's, if you want to read the full passage, it's 814 and 2816 from Isaiah. And Paul surmises this. He says, they stumbled over the stumbling block. As it is written, see, I lay in Zion a stone that causes people to stumble, a rock that makes them fall. And the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. Why would, why would God do that? Why would God cause us to stumble and make us fall? This doesn't sound like the Jesus I, I once thought I knew. I'm going to pretend I'm Paul for a second. What if God knows that we're arrogant? What if God knows that we're prideful? What if God knows that we think we already have the answer? See, Jesus, he, he has this way of, of humbling us, all of us. We have all stumbled, not just those who are considered a part of the rest, those who are considered the remnant too. We have all stumbled. The Bible's clear on that. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. There's no room for judgment here. I mean, we haven't lived up to the standard that Jesus perfectly set as he fulfilled the law, and so we stumble. This issue that Paul is addressing within his context, let's remember, uh, the Israelites, they, they struggle with righteousness. They can't accept the life that the Messiah Jesus offers them because it means they're no longer in control. They no longer get to choose what they believe. They no longer get to cherry pick which verses they hold to and which verses they discard. It's not an option. 
When you follow Jesus, he's your Lord, he's your Savior. He sets the standard. That's the deal. And so the Pharisees, they resist. They refuse. They fell just like the rest of us. The only difference is when Jesus reached down and offered his hand, they refused it. They simply said no. It's not about not falling. We all fall. We all stumble. He makes us fall. He makes us stumble. It's about accepting the offer and standing back up. It's not enough to simply recognize that you are fallen in your sin. We need to go a step further and submit to the one who stands for us. If not, we'll end up just like the Pharisees. John 8, 3, we we see this really good example of the Pharisees in a last-ditch effort to try to maintain control. Let's read the story together. It says, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees, they brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group, and they said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. Now, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus, Jesus bent down, and he started to write on the ground with his finger. Now, when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up, and he said, Let any of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stopped, and he wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard, they began to go away, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, woman, where where are they? Who has condemned you? Where have they gone? She replies, she says, no one, sir. Jesus says, then neither do I condemn you. Go now. And leave your life of sin. He's not interested in condemnation. He's interested in salvation. In transformation. It's what he desires for you. Nobody knows what Jesus was writing on the ground. Obviously it's not in the text here. But some scholars believe just based on uh, the narrative context. They believe that when Jesus bent down. He began to write in the ground. He wrote a, a list of every sin of every Pharisee present. He just listed it all out on the ground. He didn't have to say anything. He just wrote it all out and said, who are you you to point a finger? Imagine that moment. Imagine you've been caught. You know what sin you do or have done. I know what sin I do or have done. Imagine we get caught. We're filled with shame and our nakedness, just our sin just just bare for everybody to see, and we have these these so-called, these self-professed men of God come, and they point at you, and they say, God demands wrath for your sin. But what does our God actually demand? He says, go and leave your life of sin. He demands transformation. What a beautiful gift. Every detractor's finger falling. I love that they specify that the older ones left too. It's like they knew the battle was up. <laughs> they knew they'd lost this round while well, the young guys were still trying to, trying to wrestle it out with Jesus. Every single person left. Their hand fell and they left. Can we bring up the prayer team and the band, please? This offer is, is available for you this morning. There is no condemnation at the altar of Jesus Christ. If there were, I I wouldn't be up here speaking to you today. The sinless one is here to free you from your condemnation. He's here to free you from your shame. He wants to show you a new way, a new path, a new power to walk with. This is what he offers us every single time we come to him. No, no, we don't deserve it. Of course, all of our lists are very long. Of course, we have all fallen, but for some reason in his grace and in his mercy and in his great love, he chooses to give it to you anyways. Paul, he finishes his lament with a word of hope. He says this, the one who believes in him, the one who believes in this stumbling stone will never be put to shame. You don't have to worry about people coming back, about them pointing the finger again. When you stand where Jesus placed you, it doesn't matter. When you stand on his righteousness and not your own, it doesn't matter. 
when you walk in his freedom rather than wearing the burdens that you've been carrying for so long, trying to hide your shame from the world around you, trying to hide your sin because what if he finds out or what if she finds out? Jesus says this morning to you, where are your accusers? Who's pointing the finger at you this morning? You don't have to identify with your long list of sin anymore. It's too, it's too hard. It's too heavy. We aren't meant to hold it. The time for you to come to him is right now. The time for you to receive Jesus is right now. The time for you to make a change and say, no longer will I wait till tomorrow to get serious about this thing. It's right now. So as the band begins to play, I'm gonna pray. And you come forward as he urges you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your presence in this place. Thank you, Jesus, for the freedom that you offer us. Thank you for the way that you separate our sins from us and you hurl them into the sea. Thank you for the mystery and the miracle of it all. The revelation that it's not something we can earn for ourselves, it's something you want to give us. Thank you for your desire. Thank you that there is no shame and there is no guilt in you. And furthermore, there's a promise that there will be no shame. It's not coming back. Thank you for the power and the hope that you made available through the cross. Thank you for the resurrection, the offer to die with you, Jesus. I pray, Holy Spirit, for each person here today who maybe feels frustrated maybe feels convicted, maybe feels challenged, whatever it may be, Father. Holy Spirit, would you speak to them individually? You speak for yourself, God. And would you give us a, a courage and a boldness to respond when you call out? I stand at the door and knock. Those who hear my voice and open the door. I will come in and I will eat with them and they with me. Thank you for that promise, Jesus. In your beautiful name we pray. Amen.